Namaste, good morning. So today we are conducting our 61st AAA weekly webinar series, 61st episode. And today the subject is slightly different. It is a subject on valuation, which is supposed to be done by a registered valuer. And we are trying to analyze the regulations under the CIRP regulations, regulations under liquidation process regulations, and various judicial pronouncements by NCLT, NCLAT, where some issue regarding the valuation done by registered valuers are involved. We are also trying to cover the IBBI orders passed against either the insolvency professionals or registered valuers. This is actually not my subject. I am not specializing the valuation subject. However, Ankit Goel, uh, he won that he is the founder of uh, AAA valuation entity, which is uh, named as AAA valuation professionals LLP. So he is the founder and the designated partner for that. So Ankit, uh, uh, today you have to lead and you also share your experiences of various kinds of valuation. I have uh, some questions uh, from valuers and I would try to ask you those questions. The objective is that we share our combined experience, the experience of a registered valuer entity for all class of assets and experience of an insolvency professional who is getting the valuations done and face the COC as well as NCLT on many occasions where the issues of valuations are involved. Yes, Ankit, it is up to you. So good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the weekly webinar series. Uh, today's topic, I think, is very, very important for the IBC process. In recent times, if I talk about my own experience as a valuer, we have come across many scenarios where we have given a value. Then the first challenge for the insolvency professional, once the valuer gives the value to the RP, is to reconcile the two valuation reports and at several times the valuation reports are technical and it is difficult for the rp to reconcile and understand the reasons for difference in the valuation number so as i said the number can be different there can be different viewpoints from different values for the same asset but in case the basic assumptions because in many times in ibc we don't have adequate information so a lot of valuation work is done on assumptions and therefore then that reconciliation is something that is first challenge once that reconciliation is done then the process goes on and then the valuation reports have to be accepted by the coc we see in many many scenarios that the committee of creditor me members are uh, sometimes amazed by the valuation report because the valuation numbers that they have on their own records is mm, is almost always on the higher side and when that number comes to them then there is a dilemma that is the liquidation value on record is an x number and the valuation that uh, they're getting from the registered values is a, a lower number then that again something that goes on that becomes so in many cases now we are seeing that the third value is getting appointed so i think let's take it forward and i believe that we will discuss all these issues as we go forward uh, and understand what are the regulations saying about this. Should, should I share my screen or you are sharing the screen? I can share the screen. So let's start. So, uh, a famous professor, Aswat Damudran, is, uh, uh, he's very famous in the valuation field. And uh, he simply says that it is uh, basically not spreadsheets that you're making. It is the story or it is the 
prospect of that business that you are valuing. Minded that Aswad Damodaran ji is a securities or financial assets value, or maybe we can say is a is a business value more so as compared to a sing asset based value. So he is talking about company being valued and startups being valued and you know Paytm being valued, Zomato being valued, and therefore he says that. the stories are what people remember that that is the story that was being believed in so when we look at stock market stocks there also we are believing in a story with respect to the growth of that uh, uh, of that stock and so on so uh, objectives of valuation under ibc that's something that we can quickly glance through we understand that the valuation report guides the actions of the ip the coc the nclt uh even if the liquidation value uh, can be disregarded by the coc in commercial interest or in in its own commercial wisdom and they can pass a resolution which is lesser than the liquidation value it's not a very very easy process for that to happen so maybe anil sir can throw more light on what are the practical challenges in that happening and therefore that is the guidance major guidance and then there can always be the opposite as well where the liquidation mm -hmm. value is say 200 crores maybe the liquidation value should have been 300 crores and the plan for 250 crores gets passed uh, so that's also the other side so, so okay, what yeah. we have seen uh, the liquidation value and the fair value both are very very important for a resolution process and also for a liquidation process we have seen a very very reasonable resolution plans getting rejected because the registered valuer provided a liquidation value which is much higher and is not realistic now even yesterday i was discussing with some of the valuers you now the valuers actually well given a value of about 32 crores for some of the sundry debtors and then when i when i asked questions he said that there no information about these debtors were available so i analyzed these debtors on aging basis and therefore i valued it uh, at a particular value which is about 20 to 30% of the total realizable value when i actually confronted with him that for the last 5 years there is nothing has been recovered from these parties and most of these parties are proprietorship concern or partnership concern and even the kycs and the contact details are also not available then he realized that if i could have continued with this kind of valuation and the valuation of the company is enhanced like in case of 20 in case of 30 it would have gone to 60 then the quality of creditors would not have been able to would not have been able to approve a resolution plan and this is a must that the company must have gone to liquidation so there are judgments from enclad that there is no provision under the ibc that a second valuation can be obtained during cirp so if the one valuation is the only valuation that we have to rely upon therefore that valuation has to be accurate that has to be based on information provided on the other hand i have also seen some valuations where the financial assets recoverables receivables arbitration contingent assets litigation contingent assets all are valued at zero and the only reason why these assets are valued at zero is that the information provided by the rp is not sufficient now this is something which is a benefit to the promoters the promoter can definitely take advantage of such a low value and in especially in the case of uh, uh, infrastructure companies epc companies you would receive you would actually have many litigation assets and arbitration assets so the valuation actually can reduce the recovery for the stakeholders so therefore we have seen and the, on the other hand we also have seen orders that the coc has no power to direct the rp to appoint another valuer so it is only one valuer it is like one valuation process by two valuers second it cannot be repeated third in case the information information is not provided to a registered valuer they will not be responsible four the third valuer can be appointed by coc at the recommendation of the coc or in case the difference is too high these are the two reasons that the third valuer can be appointed so there has been some uh, cases 
where the resolution plans were not received, or even if it is received, it is much lower than the liquidation value. The COC decided to get the valuation done again. That was, in fact, considered as unlawful. The UNCLAT says that we have not seen any provision in the code or any provision in the regulation which authorizes the RP to conduct a fresh set of valuations. So therefore, it is one valuation, one process. It has to be perfect. Otherwise, it will be complete failure of the process in case the valuation is low. Actually, it will be less recovery and the faith on the IBC would be uh, quite disturbed. And in case the valuation is very high, the company will go into liquidation. Yes, Ankit, please go ahead. So, of course, uh, uh, this debtor issue is a contentious issue. One of the cases where the NCLAT commented on the valuation process uh, was Gujarat NRE Coke. And then subsequently, post-investigation, the, the registered value in that matter was pulled up for having given a uh, zero valuation or a valuation for debtors without analysis. But in most of the cases that we do as a valuation professional, we do give zero value, especially when we don't have ledgers available, we don't have any other information available by saying that if this information is not available with the RP or the liquidator, then the realization or the possibility of realization will be almost zero. And this contentious, this contention or this basis of giving a valuation has also been uh, questioned. We presented this kind of a report to a COC meeting. Part of the COC was saying, why did you give a zero value? Kuch to isme value hogi. And part of the COC was, of course, with us saying that there is in, in this kind of a situation, the valuer has no option but to give a zero value. So both sides uh, then, of course, have a, uh, have a point to make. So registered value typically, of course, we say competes with market and endeavors to estimate a value which is more authentic than the price of an asset. So here again, we are looking at, uh, you know, uh, and the registered value is looking at whatever information is available and trying to make sense out of that, of that asset based on that. Also physical verification, I believe helps. So when we say that the valuation process should be like this or like that, there again, uh, many occasions, uh, we feel that if there is proper support available at the time of physical verification of assets, number one, or there is adequate information available before the physical verification is done so that the valuer can study that information and then visit the plant. That also helps. So, valuation report is then, of course, a common cause of dispute. Um, that's something that we see in many orders. and. Uh, uh, the, the difference in facts is something that I already said should be ironed out at the time of draft report. So these are the possible effects of undervaluation. There can be normal gain, there can be loss of realizable value, there can be possible loss of reputation for the registered value. Possible effects of overvaluation can be rejection of resolution plan, delay in the liquidation process, and so on. Coming to the definition and coming to the understanding of what are the types of valuations under IBC. So in when we look at valuation and when we look at standards, we're looking at something called what is the standard of value or what is the basis of value. Now the basis of value, standard of value, some of those are mentioned in the international valuation standards. But then those standards also say that where the standard or where this uh, premi where the standard of value or basis of value is defined in the regulation or in the act or in the law, then there you have to follow that definition. So if you look at fair value definition, which is under regulation 2HB of CRP regulations, we are basically looking at the market value definition, which is also present in the international valuation standards. So basically we are computing market value except for a few changes. What are those changes? One, we are talking about the difference that now here we say estimated realizable value. There we say estimated market value. Secondly, we are looking at a difference where here the premise is that the 
the the the the the words are if they were to be exchanged on the insolvency commencement date there it is the if they were to be uh, sold on the uh, sold uh, uh, on the valuation date so valuation date in ivs is flexible whereas the fair value definition in uh, our code or in regulations is not flexible it wants us to do the valuation only and only on the keeping in view the valuation date as the insolvency commencement date changes which have happened thereafter can influence the value but yes those changes should not then change the value itself so somebody says my insolvency commencement date was 2 years before today and the valuation is still going on for whatever reasons let's say that is the case so the valuation is still required to be the on the date which was 2 years back you can't take the market prices today and do a valuation of that asset so that would be the essential meaning of that the second thing or the third thing that is different here from the market value definition is that here we are only valuing the assets of the corporate debtor but when we are looking at the assets of the corporate debtor we are also then ignoring the liabilities here or rather i should say that we are ignoring those liabilities which are not set off with the assets so in case my balance sheet says that there is a tds receivable from the income tax department and i want to give a value to that asset so i can easily look into the income tax website maybe look at the demands that are appearing therein and take a call or take an interpretation that since those demands have been pending since a long time any such refund is likely to be adjusted and therefore the value is zero that is something that is of course part of the interpretation of the code as well any any comment on this from your end uh no i am only trying to und understand and uh, highlight the difference in the fair value and the liquidation value mm -hmm. when i see fair value definition which is provided in regulation 2 hb of cirp regulation and i also see the liquidation value which is provided in regulation 2k of cirp regulations no like you see very clearly there are few words that i would like to highlight now this is first of all the in, the valuation has to be done as on the insolvency commencement date and there is a word like willing buyer and willing seller no willing buyer and willing seller these two phrases are being used arm length is of course okay after proper marketing proper marketing where the parties had acted knowledgeably prudently and without compulsion so one is the willing buyer second is the willing seller third is the proper marketing and fourth is the without compulsion so these four things which are used in the liquidation value these are very very significant and now in case we go to the definition of liquidation value that is estimated realizable value of the asset of the corporate is the corporate debt were to be liquidated on the insolvency commencement date and then when we see the uh, one guidance note issued by the triple ipi means the ipa of institute of chartered accountants they have also recommended one particular definition and then when the corporate debtor is under liquidation the term liquidation value may refer to a valuation of asset when the seller is compelled to sell wherein the reasonable period of time is 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 given to find a purchaser less than the required marketing period so the in the liquidation value what is missing one is the willing buyer of course willing buyer would be there but then the willing seller is not there it's a basically compulsory sale by the seller so one willing willing seller is not available number two proper marketing is not available because the timelines are provided in the liquidation timelines are also provided in the resolution process therefore the proper marketing is also not available and then the third is that it is being sold under compulsion so that's what is the liquidation value in case we have to sell within a stipulated time in case we have to sell an asset within a stipulated time and we don't have the um, proper time for marketing we don't have the proper resources for the marketing we don't have the total uh, we don't have the investment uh seen where we actually can take approval from the committee of creditors and we invest on the marketing that is also missing so that is what is the difference between the fair value and liquidation value ankit please go ahead so that's very that's that's a very important difference that is pointed out so when we talk about willing buyer willing seller 
then we talk about proper marketing then we talk about parties had acted knowledgeably prudently and without compulsion these are the essential categorization or these are the essential features of a market value when we look at ivs and therefore there we are looking at what will this asset sell in the market uh, in the normal course and liquidation value as we are looking here is again something where when we do liquidation under ibc what will be the value that will fetch in case we do liquidation of that asset this is my interpretation with respect to how the liquidation value should be defined. Then it says that that's also something that is written in part three of the triple IPI's interpretation of the liquidation value. So basically, this is what they say that if the assets are liquidated and the resolution plan was not implemented, then what will be the value of the asset? That is what the uh, liquidation value definition indicates. Now, these two words, liquidation value as well as fair value, are used in whenever we are looking at CRP regulations. But when we look at liquidation regulations and we are trying to do a valuation of assets under liquidation process, then we get the value or can we read the word realizable value. Because there, when we look at the definition or the regulations that are part of liquidation regulations, we are only looking at realizable value being mentioned. Liquidation value does not find a mention. So there the uh, idea is that liquidation value, the general understanding is that this is the value that we will get after reducing the cost incurred to sell the assets from fair or liquidation value. This is what the idea is. And uh, of course, insolvency professionals, uh, um, uh, they, 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 they talks about the same thing that the liquidation regulations mentions a realizable value and not liquidation value. So uh, the estimated realizable value of the assets of CD in case of fair value is uh, is considering a willing buyer, willing seller. And in the case of liquidation value, we're looking at reasonable marketing time, but less than the sufficient marketing time. That is the difference that they have concluded in the triple IPI document with respect to fair value and liquidation value. Now coming to some provisions in the, uh, in the valuation under IBC, here we are looking at, of course, the direct references to valuation are in 59.3 B2, which deals with voluntary liquidation. So any company that is going under voluntary liquidation would want a valuation done before the company files for a voluntary liquidation with NCLT. That is the process. Then we look at uh, AA having some rights under 46.2 with respect to getting some valuation done. And then we do start looking at the regulations then. So in regulation 27, that is for CARP regulations, we find the idea that it says that the appointment must happen within seven days of the appointment of the RP or within 47 uh, uh, of the RP and they must appoint two registered values. I mind it, I'm not talking about IRP, I'm talking about the RP. So therefore, the idea is that the, as per the timelines of the entire code, the RP gets appointed on the 30th day uh, of the uh, CRP start date and by 40th date, uh, 10 days are given for the NCLT to approve the RP's appointment. And after that, we have seven days to appoint the registered value. So based on that, the 47 days is computed. So 47 is equal to 30 plus 10 plus 7. So basically, seven days is what is the time given for the registered value to appoint the value. But here again, one of the difficulties that comes in and one of the, one of the processes that we follow in AAA is that in AAA insolvency is that we quote or seek quotations from the valuers based on the information available before the first COC meeting so that the financial approval of the cost of valuers can be taken or can be proposed before the 30th day because invariably we find that whether the IRP is continuing as RP or not, the 47th day is normally under the IRP's do domain and there uh, the uh, process does not talk about what will happen in case the COC or the regulation does not talk about what happens if the COC does not pass the financial approval for a valuer. So in many cases, in AAA valuation, we are appointed by, val by uh, RPs on a provisional basis, where in the appointment letter, they say that you are appointed. Uh, this is the fee at which you are appointed, but this is subject to ratification by the COC. The fee is subject to ratification by the COC. So that is how we are getting appointed in several cases where the COC has not approved the financial proposal of appointing valuers. Then we come to regulation 
65 so this any any further comment on the appointment process i think we can we have talked I about this in the past as well we can uh-huh, go yes, ahead. Yes, yes yes so then we talk about uh, regulation 35 of the ibbi regulations this again just briefly attend to yeah, these yeah so this is so these are regulation 35 of the uh, of the uh, fast track regulations then uh, that also requires evaluation then voluntary process or voluntary liquidation process regulation 31 b2 requires it then regulation 26 of the fast track insolvency process then regulation 34 of the ibbi uh, regulations liquidation regulations th- regulation 35 also is there so now we can look at all these regulations appointment of professionals we have already talked about how the seventh day 47th day uh, and then two registered values are important and how the irp invariably does this work so then we are looking at uh, appointment uh, shall follow just just hold on please just hold on so i i can say one thing uh, the as far as this appointment is concerned one that the irp or rp whosoever is appointing the valuers first of all there are responsibilities that a relative of the resolution professional cannot be appointed related party of the corporate debtor cannot be appointed an auditor of the corporate debtor at any time during the period of five years preceding the insolvency commencement date cannot be appointed a partner or director of the insolvency professional entity ipe of which the resolution professional is a partner or a director cannot be appointed now the other thing is that the invoice for the fee and other expenses incurred by the professionals appointed under this regulation shall be raised in the name of the professional and be paid directly into the bank account of such professional ankit one clarification that i need like are you able to raise your invoice from the i from the rve yes very much so then you are not supposed to get 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 the invoice from all the three class of valuers because uh, when you look when you look at when you look at the regulations and when you look at the word uh, uh, registered value the word registered value itself includes registered value entities so right. here the interpretation or raw interpretation can give you an uh, give you an uh, indication that oh this is an individual registered value we are talking about but when you look at regulation it also refers to the entity fair enough i think we can move forward So regulation 35 uh, insolvency resolution process for corporate persons so before i conclude this one of the things that i've observed is many insolvency professionals give three different appointment letters for three different asset classes to us and that is something that uh, uh, is a practice in, in among some of the ips uh, which uh, i find uh, you know little merit in so that's something that i can talk about here because that's concerning the appointment process so uh, uh, we in the past have also done or also sought valuation quotes from valuers where we are ips uh, on a combined basis where we say these are the three asset classes all three asset classes are required to be done by an rve which is registered for three asset classes and they should give a combined quote and then we present that comparison to the uh, to the uh, coc for their approval of fee so there again uh, we are not then we do not appoint different valuers for different parts one of the merits of doing that is that when it comes to fair value computation enterprise value computation where you have to look at you know different aspects of the same company or you're looking at some asset parts or parts of the assets of the company which are uh, not part of the books of accounts so recently i will give you an example so that we got an rfq for a company and then when we investigated or you know did bit a little bit of research we found that the uh, uh the 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 it was a very very well drafted rfq a lot of information was provided with respect to the cd but one of the questions that i had was that does this company have any trademarks and that information was missing in that system in that whole uh, a whole system and if somebody would have started uh looking into the possible trademark valuation of a, an alcoholic beverage company then it can have actually a very high value so bottling plant etc etc can have a different value but if you have a very very established liquor brand then that can have a value in itself so then the, and, and imagine losing out or missing on the liquidation value of that brand in in, in a valuation process so uh, that's uh, because that was not part of the books of accounts it was perhaps missed by the rp yeah ankit you can move forward 
So regulation 35 uh, of, uh, now we talk about fair value and liquidation value. So regulation 35 says how the two valuation, two registered values appointed under regulation 27 need to submit their, uh, submit to the RP, the estimated fair value and liquidation value after physical verification of inventory and fixed assets. Then it talks about how the two estimates of value in an asset class, if they're significantly different, or on receipt of a proposal to appoint a third valuer from the committee of creditors, the resolution professional may appoint a third registered valuer for an asset class for submitting an estimate of value computed in the manner provided in clause A. In clause A, then we talk, uh, then we, then we talk about explanation. We look at asset class. So asset class can be, of course, three asset classes, land and building, plant and machinery, SFA. There can be some confusion between different registered valuers and what are what is covered in what asset classes. So, say an inventory for land and building can be easily said to be covered in a land and building asset class. Similarly, a leasehold interest somebody can say is part of a land and building uh, a leasehold uh, land interest can be part of a land and building valuer's uh, uh, scope of work. Uh, a, a complicated or a spare parts of machinery can be part of maybe plant and machinery a registered valuer and not an SFA valuer. So these are some variations in the asset class parts or some complications there. Now that aside, then when you look at significantly different, then it means difference of 25% in the liquidation value under an asset class and same shall be calculated as L1 minus L2 divided by L1. So the formula is given so that there's no confusion here. And then this is a difference that is only and only required in liquidation value. And mind it, the difference is required to be seen at the uh, level of the asset class. So the asset class level valuation differences need to be taken care of. So it says if the two estimates of value in an asset class are significantly different. So now based on this regulation, it becomes important that the liquidation value at least should give different values to different asset classes so that they're comparable between two, uh, uh, two registered value reports. Uh, now, in case you talk about liquidation as a going concern, then sometimes the giving the value or individual valuation to asset classes becomes difficult. For a piecemeal asset valuation, it is it is easy. So therefore, the piecemeal val piecemeal liquidation becomes the king here, or rather the the leader here, so that the asset class level differentiation can be done. Ankit, here I would actually like to say the wording is after physical verification of the inventory and fixed assets of the corporate debtor. Yeah. Now, there are almost 50% of the companies that the most of the insolvency professionals are facing that there are no updated records available. Mm. There is no FAR available. And there is no item-wise list of assets are available. When these registered valuers are asking information from the insolvency professionals, they are not able to provide that information because of pendency of books of account for the last few years, non-availability of books of account. It is only the balance sheets are available in some cases and that too on the public portals. So when I checked up with the physical verification scenario, then the valuers are saying that we have to work on a list which will be provided by you. If you provide us a list of assets, then we will physically verify it. Otherwise, we would not be able to give you a certificate that we are we have physically verified. No, even on the other side, suppose an insolvency professional gets a, a record of the assets of the company, and he just sends that record of assets to the registered valuer. The registered valuer also went there for physical physical verification, and then he went there alone, and he could, nobody from the RP team was accompanying him, then he can always say that the list provided by you of the assets, he would mark some uh, sh shortage. He will he will just do it on Excel sheet, some uh, reductions, some benefits, and finally he will give the certificate, registered value certificate is coming based on one, the information provided by the promoters, and also information uh, the physical verification when a person goes there and he doesn't even know the names of the component, the physical verification is something that even if it is not done by the registered valuer, later on, he will always say that he has done the physical verification 
and the assets were available at that time when I visited. Now that is something which is a very, very dangerous situation for insolvency professionals that the registered valuer in fact is uh, giving a certificate of valuation based on the data that you have provided. So you have provided the data of uh, uh, current assets, uh, registered uh, like uh, sundry debtors, and you have as RP, I have not physically verified the inventory, but what I feel is that the valuers can always say, when I went there, it was available. Now it is not available. I do not know what happened. And then the RP will become responsible. Like if the valuer is saying the assets assets were six or seven, now the assets are only two. Where are the balance four? The valuer will say that I physically verified it when I went there. And actually, the books are still showing six assets, whereas the before the commencement of uh, CIRP, the promoters somehow took away uh, some of the assets. It is happening mostly in the name of, in, in the case of cars. So any input that you would like to give on this physical verification, how big is the responsibility for the valuer? How can, can't you give the certificate without even going there, with just creating an evidence that you went there? Would it be really helpful for the process? Should IP rely on this physical verification? What are your uh, uh, answers to this, Ankit? So I always say that when we used to say that, okay, we are, as, as let's say as an auditor, when we used to go to a client place and the question that was put to us was that, have you done any physical verification? So physical verification, uh, uh, we talk about how the physical verification can be done. So one is taking physical inventory, taking physical, making a, phys making a list based on your physical inspection. But whenever the word physical verification is used, it is always something where you are verifying an existing record. So in cases where the list of assets is not provided by the, uh, uh, by the promoters, by the management, or where the, this, this cooperation is not granted, my thought process is that it becomes, it seems to become the responsibility of the RP to get the physical list of assets made. I will also give you an example, like in one of the cases where we took a very large inventory, uh, we got some support from the management, but at the same time, that support was limited to getting the uh, book records of all the physical inventory that was available with the person. And it was not that physical, that, that book record may not be matching with the physical verification, the physical status of the various items. So therefore, the reconciliation of the two uh, uh, then becomes the responsibility of the RP. And subsequently, then we're looking at physical verification by the valuer. This is my interpretation here. And I believe that IIIPI has also taken note of a similar system that the verification, the responsibility is verification and not creating the list of assets. So there are many questions, Ankit. I think we have to take up some questions. And these are very, very relevant to the subject that we are presently taking up. One question is from uh, Vinay Kant, and he says, uh, IBC commences in the year April 23, and the last balance sheet received from the uh, promoters or anyone is 2015 and 16. How to take up this issue? How to get this valuation done? Now, this is so, a complicated issue, Ankit. I definitely would share my experience that in such cases, whatever balance sheet that we have, and then it actually becomes very, very important that the RP team must go to those locations of the assets and the businesses of the company. The RP team must prepare a physical inventory of every location, every place, and in case possible, a kind of panchanama may also be created. And the panchanama that we create under surface law, that is helpful with some witnesses that when I took over, when I went to the premises, I found these assets. And along with the asset, one should take the pictures and one should take the videography of the visit of the RP to the locations. Now, this is for the physical assets. Now, as far as this uh, financial assets, book assets 
I would say that nowadays it is expected that the insolvency professional will get the books restructured, would get the books completed after taking the bank statements and whatever way the books can be completed, it should be completed, it should be uh, subject to the transactional audit and it should also be subject to the valuation of financial assets. So even if it takes time, the NCLT would be liberal in granting extensions. And in case it is not possible, and then what I'm saying that immediately on appointment, the insolvency professional must start the process of reconstructing the books. That's something which is important. So therefore, uh, this uh, saying that we could not get anything from the promoters or we could not get anything from the statutory auditors that is not getting accepted nowadays the insolvency professional has to show his efforts like what he has done how he tried to obtain information how he tried to capture the actual physical availability of the assets and how finally he actually justified his efforts to understand the financial assets of the company the second asset the second question is i'm coming from lalit maheshwari when valuer gives false undervalued report in connivance with COC, what action can be taken against valuers? I think this allegation would not be able to prove that the, it is in connivance with the COC, the valuers is giving the valuation which is much false or it is lower. However, the there are two valuers. If both are working that way and both are actually getting giving a valuation uh, in connivance with committee of creditors, then the what actual evidence the insolvency professional RP would have, number one, that the valuation is lower, what would be the evidence that the valuation is lower or the valuation, valuation is false? Second, what would be the evidence that they are conniving with the COC? These two questions are very large questions. However, one, once we say that if the COC is satisfied, if the two valuers are giving a report which is uh, technically correct, if the information which has been asked from the RP has been provided, if the information which is not available, the RP has made efforts to collect that information. If all this is done, then I don't think the RP has any locus to file any complaint without any evidences. So, like one, one, we, yes, yes, one, one addition here is that the RP is getting the, the, the step, step by step processes that the draft report is shared by the valuer to the RP. Let's say if the valuer is conniving with the COC, the valuer maybe has also shared, maybe unofficially, the report with the COC to make sure that the reports are, the values are uh, as per the as, as requirement, as per the requirement of the COC. But when we come to the, uh, the, the decision of the RP, so then the RP is give, getting the report, the draft report, the RP can comment on the report and give some questions to the RV or some observations to the RV. So let's say the RV has taken an assumption that this is X land area and that land area in, in fact is factually incorrect. So there the RP, it's the duty of the RP to then go back and say that no, this is not a factual case. The fact has been reported wrongly in your report. But the major issues with the valuation reports are surrounding the market area of land or, you know, market value of machinery. There again, it becomes important for the RP to inform the valuer, maybe on record, that please look into the values that you are giving to the land and building. And maybe the RP can share his own uh, market survey with respect to how the values might be higher or lower and so on. So that the, uh, there, there is a good due record that the RP in, made sure or rather did everything in his control to get the values to the uh, closer, closer to the real values. So another question that is Lalit Maheshwari is asking, can AAA insolvency professionals appoint valuers from AAA valuation professionals? No, absolutely no. Even if the AAA insolvency professionals is providing a support services to any RP, even then the valuers from AAA valuation cannot be appointed. Uh, then we have another question, Ankit, in case you have studied it, you can answer it. What is the difference between method adopted under income tax rules 11 UA and valuation standards? So 11 UA um, is a complex rule, has multiple methods that are prescribed for different kinds of valuations, which are required under Income Tax Act. Income Tax Act primarily requires valuation for two purposes. 
वन इज अंडर फिफ्टी सिक्स सेक्शन फिफ्टी सिक्स टू टेन वेयर द रूल से दैट नो शेयर ऑफ एनी कंपनी शुड बी सोल्ड लेस देन देयर फेयर वैल्यू सो देयर देयर इज अ रेगुलेशन और रूल इन इलेवन यू ए विच टॉक्स अबाउट हाउ द शेयर वैल्यू ऑफ अ कंपनी विल बी कंप्यूटेड फॉर दैट पर्पज वेयर यू विल रिप्लेस द circle rate of a immovable property from the with the book uh, by you will replace that value and you know delete the book value of that land which is appearing in your balance sheet and then you'll compute an x value of your company's shares and you have to then sell that share or you the valuation for the purpose of capital gain as well as for under 56 to 10 will be based on that value The second uh, use of 11 UA is when you are allotting new shares, and where 56 to 7B comes into play, which says that in case you are getting more value, the company is getting more value than its fair value from an investor, then that value is taxable in the hands of the company. So these both uh, rules are part of 11 UA, and 11 UA then talks about how DCF can be used, or only DCF can be used in case you are allotting new shares for uh, uh, the process. but there the uh, they have already come out with the proposed changes there so that i think is a short lived system when we look at ivs ivs allows you to use many options it will talk about cost method it will talk about uh, cost approach market approach income approach so it's way more complex and it is something where you can determine the uh, the method or the approach based on the kind of asset that you are having and the kind of information that you are getting another question from vinita maheshwari it says that if the values are not significantly different can coc recommend third valuation based on difference between the methods of valuation of two valuers we have just read regulation 35 of the cirp regulations and it is very clear that either the rp can recommend a third valuer based on the difference or the coc can say that they want to appoint third valuer whatever may be the reason the coc has the power to appoint a third valuer another question comes from the manmohan jindal he says may the may the live photographic and one done... more, one one comment here one comment here that in case two valuers have given a report which where the report let's say is not significantly different and the values are closer and they are within 25% range and the coc asks for a third value to be appointed so the third valuer's report will become Uh, uh will create any impact only if a scenario arises where the third valuer's report is closer to the first or the second valuer such that it is creating a difference in the average valuation because the rule says that in case the third valuer is appointed you still have to take the average of the closest two valuation so let's say two valuers are appointed the third comes in and gives a valuation which is 50% higher than the two valuers that valuation report will have no uh, no 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 say it will not have any effect on the process right so i think the manmohan uh, manmohan jindal is asking whether this photographic cost will be part of the valuation expenses yes this will be part of the valuation expenses and will form part of the cirp cost how do we build a checkpoint that can prevent suc manipulation as regards physical verification what are the best practices the best practices are when the physical valuation is being happen the team of the liquidator or the team of the rp must accompany the uh, valuers in fact in fact now the valuers are saying that counting and making a list is not our duty it is the it is the duty of the irp or rp to prepare a physical inventory of all the assets then only we would be able to give a value however they agree that if you are not able to provide me the cost if you are not able to provide me the invoices and the date of purchase then still based on the physical verification i would be able to give a value but counting and doing the physical verification is not the duty of the uh, valuer this is what the valuers are mostly saying like another uh, question is coming from uh, pd rasam in one case cbi has questioned as a liquidator on stock misuse by the promoter uh stock cbi has questioned as a liquidator on stock misuse by promoter so it is the duty of the liquidator to answer all the questions as asked by any investigating agency and whatever information is available with the liquidator is, is supposed to be provided in my cases 
I like the CBI is asking me the questions which are even five years older than my appointment in that case. So now what is the scenario? What, the, what is the uh, uh, law? The law says that when the liquidation starts, all the records of the company will come under the physical possession of the liquidator. The liquidator will take away all that eight, nine years record, 10 years record, which are required to be maintained under any law in India. Those records has to be taken, maybe truckload or maybe two truckload or maybe three truckloads of records has to be taken in custody by the liquidator. If I'm selling all the assets, all the offices of the company, then I have to carry it. And now what we are doing is that there are many agencies in India where the physical stocks can be kept and it can be kept for eight years and they are charging uh, those kind of uh, rentals and those rentals will become part of the CIRP cost. Now the CBI has asked me records which are even uh, earlier like older four five years older than the commencement of CIRP period so I was able to take them to the uh, these agencies where I have kept the records and the lists were provided to CBI. The CBI chose the files that they wanted and it was taken from that particular agency and it was handed over to CBI and CBI gave a receipt to us. So this is a kind of practical, uh, it actually has to be done wherever it is required and it is the duty of the uh, insolvency professional in the capacity as IRP, RP or the liquidator to, to cooperate with all the investigating agencies. Because in this scenario, in this particular capacity, all your assets, all your rights, all your obligations will go together, travel together. If you are saying that you are the CEO of the company, then your obligation also comes as a CEO of the company. So you have the ownership of the records, so you have to transfer. Yes, Ankit, you can take up. So any further questions that we should take up? Uh, there is a question, Kyle, can there be a joint visit of RP and the RB? Yes, there is a possibility of a joint visit by the resolution professional and the, uh, the registered valuers. And if this is done, it can be cost effective also. But even during this period, I have seen that the uh, registered valuers are saying that uh, the counting and making a list is not our duty. It is the duty of the insolvency professional to make a list of all components, assets, machines, so that we are able to value. This is specifically in respect of the uh, stocks and also the spares. So who will do the reconstruction of the books of account? This is also a question from Mr. Manohan Jaddal. The reconstruction of the books of account is the duty of the RP. RP can appoint accountant, RP can appoint chartered accountant, RP can appoint any kind of person who actually will go to banks to take bank statements for the last five years. And based on those bank statements, the, R the RP uh, can appoint accountants after presenting it before the COC for approval of their fee. In case the COC doesn't approve the fee, RP has actually, it will be seen that the RP has made efforts. However, the COC did not approve the fees. Therefore, the accounting could not be completed. So that actually will be taken on record. In case any RP, the question is, further question is, in case any RP has taken custody of all assets from the IRP and should have ensured physical existence of the assets, I think, yes, the, it is the duty of the RP that whatever asset is are being handed over by the IRP to RP, the RP must take his own videography, photography, inventory, listing, everything has to be done by the RP. In case it has not been done by the IRP, then the IRP must give in writing that he did not have any list of the assets. So whatever list is prepared by the RP, that is final, so that in future he, couldn't, he shouldn't say that uh, I had these assets, I handed over these assets to RP, but now the assets are missing. It is the responsibility of the RP that he should not be able to say. Then the question is coming uh, from uh, uh, C.H. Chavi. Isn't picture not taken, that is photos? Um, I couldn't understand. Like, um, we are only saying that the videos and photographies can be taken. Uh, then the Vinay Kant says, last balance sheet received from IRP last balance sheet receives from wherever it has been received. The bell, what we are supposed to see is the assets of the company which are appearing in the balance sheet and then matching it with the physical assets. That's the only thing that we have to see. So there are many questions, Ankit. I think we should continue with our PPT. Uh, the time is short. In fact, 
there are 40 questions and we can take it up uh, the next time. So basically now we're coming about regulation that uh, under section 35 that when, when, what, what do we see in the liquidation regulations? So in the liquidation regulation simply first says that where the valuation has already been conducted in CRP or fast track insolvency, there the said values or the average of the estimates can be used for the liquidation purpose as well. Then it says that in case it is not covered under subregulation one or where the liquidator is of the opinion that fresh valuation is required under the circumstances. So what can be the circumstances? The valuations earlier can be three years old, five years old, two years old. In that process, one can say that, no, I don't want to use those valuation reports. So he, there he has to appoint, the liquidator has to appoint the valuers within seven days. And again, he values or appoints two valuers. Here the word that is used is, to determine the realizable value of the assets or businesses under clause A to F of regulation 32 of corporate debtor. So basically here, then it refers to 32, refers to A to F, which talks about various ways in which the liquidation of the assets can be liquidated, which also includes liquidation as a going concern for now. So therefore here, the possibilities of having different liquidation valuations under or different valuations under di different liquidation premises or different liquidation ways is possible. One can say that, okay, I will sell each and every of these assets on a piecemeal basis. That can, that might have a possibility of giving a very different value as compared to valuing or selling the whole land and building and the plant and machinery on top of it as a combined unit. So the values can be very, very different. Then of course uh, the same uh, process where you know these are the bar these are the uh, these are the people who cannot be appointed as registered valuers and then of course it talks about independent valuation again talks about physical verification of the assets of the corporate debtor and then again says that the average of two estimates shall be taken as the value of assets of businesses here it does not talk about uh, appointing a third valuer it simply says that in case the values are different the average value can be taken. So this is the process in uh, liquidation regulations. Then, uh, of course, we talked about what all. So let's quickly so, talk think, about. Uh, yeah. We will uh, we will come out with this uh, separate uh, uh, webinar where we would cover all the judgments uh, from NCLT, NCLAT, and also from the uh, IBB. IBBA, IBBA. So order. that will be a separate webinar that we would conduct. I think we can take some of the questions because there are many questions today and then we only have two, three minutes. We'll have to finish within two minutes. Uh, no, I think the questions which are coming, I can take the questions coming latest. Uh, as Sanjeev Kumar says, how valuation of financial assets which are under dispute? No, the valuation of financial assets which are under dispute, there is a process of valuation. Ankit, you can best explain this, how the disputed financial assets normally you value. So we have done many such valuations and there we, you know, at, at many times we find that we are given a legal opinion, which is taken uh, by the RP or by the company at a prior, prior date. And we feel that valuing or as independent valuers, in case we value an asset or value a receivable based on that opinion, it will not be the proper process. So what we normally tend to do in case the information is available is to look at all the legal documents that are available with respect to that dispute. It can involve maybe an application filed with any court or tribunal, the reply filed to it, the rejoinder filed to it. Then, you know, all the documents, all the trailing documents, all the attachments. And then we try and find out that what kind of value is receivable with respect to this uh, litigation or arbitration matter. And there, uh, several times we find that the company's claims that we, it, it has to get or the CD's claims that it is due to get 1000 crores from this customer or client is something which is uh, which, which has simple flaws because the basic documents that the company should have with respect to providing those services or establishing that it has provided those services are missing in record. So that becomes an, an issue. Normally, we also find... Uh, that many advocates were involved in helping the corporate debtor or the RP in managing these arbitration matters are shy from sharing all the documents. And uh, they are also of the opinion always that this amount is receivable, which is difficult to trust in absence of those documents. 
So, Ankit, there is a question which says that the machinery was purchased in 2009-11. It worked for three, four years, and then it was idle for eight years. And the uh, the now the liquidator is not getting a customer. So, like the, how the liquidation can be concluded. So, one scenario is that the uh, the first of all the registered valuer has to value it, not only on the age. It is also on the obsolescence. So there are various kinds of obsolescence. Ankit, can you just uh, explain something that how many kinds of obsolescence are there? Like, there is physical like obsolescence. We were discussing, the, we were discussing this uh, case scenario today morning with Ankit, like how to value the assets of the plant and machinery of the thermal power plant. When it was originally set up about five years back, 10 years back, it was costing about six crores per megawatt. Now the market value is only one crore per megawatt. And there are many plants which has not even functioned. So how do, uh, what kind of valuation we do? Like, should we do this? Even the replacement value today is not lesser. It is again five crores per uh, megawatt. However, the kind of, like now the Ankit will explain what kind of obsolescence factor is applicable to such cases so that the valuation can come to one crore and we find a buyer. Yes, Ankit. So for any asset that we're doing under valuation, under cost method, where we are using something called a depreciated replacement cost method, there, there, is, a, there is a requirement in the IVS for the valuer to consider the various obsolescences. The obsolescence can be on account of physical obsolescence, which can then be bifurcated into curable physical obsolescence or uncurable physical obsolescence. Uh, then it is functional obsolescence, uh, it can be uh, economical or external obsolescence. So for example, of this machinery that we got in the question, there I believe that we have to test whether that machine is still usable or would have a market for any possible use based on the uh, functional obsolescence. So let's say that there is a manual uh, uh, clothes weaving machine that is available. Today, that machine may not have any takers because maybe everyone would be using a, a much advanced technology and nobody will be using that machine or very few people will be using that machine. Similarly, I give you an example where we did a valuation of a, uh, of a, of a plant that was making uh, caps, uh, uh, which is making uh, uh, these uh, uh, caps or closures. There again, we understood that the technology or the modern technology is now moving to plastic caps and therefore the traditional traditional closures are no longer something that are in fashion and it is a it is a technology which is kind of getting obsolete so therefore those machines may not find any takers because the technology is something that is no longer in use too much and it might those machines might be sold and might be transferred to some other country but maybe in india nobody will be a taker for that machine Coming back to the thermal power plant, there the obsolescence that would be there would be external or economic obsolescence, where we are looking at the fact that the plant is costing us 5 megawatt, but it is unviable to be operated primarily because of the coal cost, primarily because of the limited tariff that is available with respect to the production that we are making, non-absence of a PPA, where we will not be able to realize the fixed cost that we have put into the plant. Because all these plants are conceived with the idea that okay, we will put this fixed cost into the plant and we will be able to enter into a PPA with some discom, which will also give us recovery of the fixed cost for the next 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, and so on. So that would be the obsolescence there. So Ankit, although there are many questions, but then we have to conclude. And I am really very, very like kind of uh, happy that uh, it was so interactive session today. Uh, we have received something like uh, 50 questions and out of the 50 questions in fact more of more than 10 15 were basically on, it's only the appreciation that it is a well, very well conducted uh, session on valuation yes we are not really satisfied with this session today because see we could not come to the real and clear judgments and ibbi orders on the uh, insolvency professionals and also on the registered valuers. So we will come up with a separate sub a webinar for uh, that particular subject, which is very important because not many actually uh, not, the, not the this content is not available so far uh, anywhere. Uh, in, so therefore, then we thank you very much uh, for this uh, response, and uh, we will remain connected with you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you, everyone. Pleasure.